good morning everybody uh, welcome back after the tea session hope everybody is recharged now uh, so this topic risk mitigation strategies what's the risk that we are really talking about what am i really going to cover we had a full panel discussion on how technology is changing you know how we are how industry is looking at uh, technology how we can use the technology and now this technology can act as a deterrent as well as uh, as a advantage and there is industry and what can industry do to you know with the technology for tax purposes last couple of years we noticed you know lot of changes in the tax landscape economic landscape not only tax landscape let's take the economic landscape the way our economy is functioning the way gst has got implemented uh, the technology that is being used by our economy i think our government has been on the forefront with respect to the technology that they have been introducing not only in forget the tax tax aspect of it even for the other smaller aspects you know your uh, land registrations need to be now done on or your flat registrations need to be done online your uh, upi payments the biggest technology covin app that came in just immediately after uh, covid so the government has been using technology to the fullest i think once sushma swaraj came into uh, at least for me when she became the external minister i realized the importance of twitter you know and how twitter could be used to help ourselves outside india so that's the way government has been using technology and cbdt has not been much far behind they have been taking data from all relevant sources if you have noticed i won't say slowly and steadily it's actually quick and steadily they have introduced so much compliance and technology related data assimilation uh, formula that industry somewhere has been left behind you know we i see that industry is struggling with collating so much of data and the way the government has been collating the sft returns for example you know you look at the sft returns that you are required to file by 31st of may you look at uh, your uh, return of income mandate you know that they have bought in the 10f filing mandate which came in recently you have to file it online these are ways and means of monitoring and the ways or means of getting data assimilated by the government now what's happened in the last couple of years i'll say um, decade would be too far i would want to even rec restrict it since covid times you know the first thing was the regulatory and the landscape regulatory landscape that underwent a change see the number of provisions that have got introduced since the covid times are not even going beyond that these last 3 years you saw about equalization levy coming in scp provisions coming in the uh, reassessment framework completely overhauled uh, the reason was that they wanted to bring in more stability and assurance to the assessees that your cases won't be picked up uh, beyond a particular time limit whether that has really happened whether they have really given you stability that remains a matter of debate faceless assessment one big step that the department has taken in this covid times was faceless assessments this is completely technology driven your email automated notices coming in your uh, right from e notices coming in on an email to filing submissions adjournments on email doing video conferencing for hearings and then getting the order on the system itself on the portal itself everything driven and in fact tracking of demands tax demands subsequently on the portal everything is technology driven coming to the last one equalization levy as i spoke about scp provisions all of this brought about some level of uncertainty around the way things are being functioned and looked about by the tax department and whether the industry is geared up to meet those challenges coming to the uncertain tax positions we had a very recent supreme court decision which surprised most of the ssc's out here on the mfn clause that notifications were necessary then if you see in the last 3 years now again i'm looking at last 3 to 4 years we have had multiple supreme court and high court decisions one has been on royalty there has been a capital and revenue debate on the telecom sector there has been a supreme court decision on the mfn matter there has been a high court multiple high court decisions on various other matters the recent matter which is now being debated at supreme court is esop deductibility payment of esop payments all these are uncertain tax positions why i say uncertain 
you may have taken a position basis your reading of law and the relevant jurisprudence around it at that point in time the way things are moving now most matter, matters are reaching up to the high court and to the supreme court we are waiting for the supreme court to give in their uh, given its guidance those supreme court decisions again are being challenged by the government or by the assessees in a review petition and therefore the uncertainty and in all of this i think in the panel also someone mentioned it was like 15 years prior and 15 years next you need to be prepared for it so there is a risk whatever position you take today there is a risk how do you mitigate all of it then there is data linkages this is one thing that uh, i don't know everybody at least i had experienced in few of my clients where uh, notices were issued saying that okay customs has given us this import data please explain how has it been accounted in your books i mean see the data exchange that is happening import data from customs given to you to reconcile with your books 26 as being reconciled with your books standard question today in your uh, uh, notices you know so that has been where you know the government has tried or has at least started linking data whether it is fully successful i wouldn't say really it's fully successful there are challenges no doubt but the intention is very clear do not try to fix things with gst x reporting y reporting in uh, income tax and z reporting for customs keep it consistent that is how the government wants to even monitor it and then the last one increased monitoring of tax returns you i i mean there have been notices that have been issued recently in 2020 you issued a 15 ca please explain what was the tax position and why did you take that tax position now you are grappling which is this 15 ca they are talking of because they give you only an acknowledgement number so then those kind of reviews are being taken up by the department why are they able to do this why this was not happening 10 years ago or decade ago we didn't get these kind of notices it happened it's happening because all of this is automated and put on to the income tax portal a 15 ca or 15 cb is filed on the income tax portal it's readily available with the tax department for you them to pick it up and then assess it what you know many times it happens that okay i have issued a 15 ca i said i'm doing a withholding at the rate of 10% for an entity when he sees his 26 as that 10% is not reflected in its 26 as because in the withholding tax you have not reported it correctly that's how withholding tax returns are being picked up for assessment 1336 notices recently there has been a spurt especially after 148a coming in there has been a spurt in 1336 notices again this is data assimilation by the tax department to see what is being missed from being taxed there is a wide criteria for selecting reassessment and then the increase in the number of tax surveys and searches that are happening so overall if you see there has been a change in the way the industry is functioning the way economy is functioning and the way the government is functioning everything is undergoing a slow and steady change industry needs to cope up with data industry needs to cope up with reconciliations getting it all assimilated together one way to do it obviously is manual which many things are still not automated to the fullest extent but manual is also effort right it is manual effort that is going in there is a time consumption there is a data archival issue that is happening this these challenges could be mitigated and need to be mitigated on a very import Im immediate matter in a immediate manner now what happens with your uh, compliances i know the multiple compliances be it gst law be it income tax law be it fema be it company law multiple compliances that are there those compliances i've just captured tax because i am a tax person but you yeah, have just captured see the number if you fail to file your return of income there is a penalty these are the penal consequences but on the right there are additional exposures and if you see there are multiple sections which lead to prosecution last month there was a high court madras high court decision which actually allowed the cbdt to continue with a prosecution because the assessee failed to file a return of income so they said that no continue with the prosecution prosecution is on the principal officer on the cfo and on the directors of the company 
and see the number of provisions which lead to prosecution. The return not filed, withholding tax not paid on time, delay in payment of withholding tax. Simple thing, reason why prosecution is being introduced or is being uh, used by the tax department in the recent times. I have handled at least seven to eight compounding applications in the last two years on, you know, getting just because there has been a delay in deposit of withholding tax. Unexplained false entries in the books of account. Now this false entries, unexplained entries, that itself is so wide. How do you even define it? And where do you sit with it? And then all of that leads to prosecution. See, penalty paying is one aspect of it. That is a cash outflow. It may lead to some bad talk about it, but prosecution is more severe, you know, it is personal. It's more severe. And then after you do all these compliances, you still have a penalty that may be imposed for underreporting of income, and then there is a misreporting of income for which you may have a penalty. So now, because of this change in the tax environment and the way things are moving and the way industry needs to cope up, the simplest solution and the first step towards risk mitigation should be compliance. Be compliant. Now what is compliance? It's not only filing the return on time, 30th November due date, I have filed it on 29th November, I am compliant, no. Compliance is way beyond. It has to be correct and accurate compliance. Whether you are capturing all your data, whether you are making a disclosure correctly, whether you are covering all the information that is available in public domain, or in your domain. So it starts with registration. Now why I started with registration, one is of course every SSE needs to get a PAN and all that's no brainer. But foreign entities, earning, enti in, earning income from India, require to get a PAN in India and file a return if they are using the tax treaty benefits. There has been a resist resistance from a lot many non-resident companies on why do we need to file returns in, in India. Why should I do compliance in India? But it is required, it is mandatory. The first step would be to get yourself registered properly. Then the timely filing, obviously compliance begins with the timely filing. You are a delayed filer, you have penal consequences coming in. Then, as I said, timely filing is not the only thing. It has to be complete and accurate information reporting. Taking data, how do you ensure this complete and accurate information in today's world? Where most of the things are on SAP or on an ERP system and it is otherwise available on various portals like your GST reportings, it is your income tax reportings, is it your annual reportings, all of this. So that data needs to be all collated, reconciled and then a correct and accurate filing becomes necessary. And then payment of taxes on time. Again, pay, no, do not pay the tax on time. You have huge interest exposures. So again, that becomes this. So correct and timely, I would always say not timely filing only, but correct filing is more important to be compliant. And this is the first step to reduce your risk exposures in today's dynamic economy. What happens if you're non-compliant? Just think of it, you know. Penalty, one part of it. Legal consequence, we talked about prosecution that may be bought in. What about the reputational damage that happens because of it? It is slow and subtle, but it happens and it is it impacts you big time. The share value goes down, there is reputational damage just because you're not compliant. This is a very simple step, right? It's in your hands to go and be compliant. How do you ensure your compliance or what are your steps in compliance? Give trainings, regular trainings, internal discussions to your staff. There are internal and external audits. They have to be completed within timelines. There is collaboration with legal and tax experts that is necessary in today's world. Not because they will bring in only what technical knowledge you have. It is because they bring in a lot of industry experience onto the table. What is the other industry doing on a similar tax position? That is something a tax or a legal expert will bring in. And then there has to be a proactive compliance approach. You have to be proactive, be timely, you have to do this on you. Take it as a priority, it can be a cost. I know it is a cost, it is time consuming, 
but it has to be done proactively. In all of this scenario that we talked about and we had the panel earlier, how to use technology, I think I don't understand blockchain and AI and all that. That's a, that's, I'm a little illiterate on that front. Of course, these are technologies that have been developed, but for me, technology is automation. Bringing in automation, bringing in accuracy, bringing in reconciliation, bringing in efficiency, and bringing in transparency. That is technology for me. So if you see compliance, it may seem like a mundane job, you know, doing it on a timely basis, accurate, doing a reconciliation. Yes, it is a mundane job. Then therefore, bring in technology, automate it as much as possible, automate whatever processes are possible to be automated. Bring in transparency, it brings in transparency, it brings in data management, archival of data, it is giving you better visibility, control on the data. Now, with this compliance, I think MIS reporting also becomes very easy and it becomes very, uh, you know, very value added if your compliance is on time and it is accurate and it is complete. It is obviously reducing risk, it improves data accuracy, and then if it is automated, obviously time efficiency is something that is the key. Some processes that could be, you know, lit, uh, some processes I've just picked up a few, which could be automated, thought of, you know, just telling you there is 26 AS reconciliation. Notices, as I said, it's a standard line, you know, today, reconcile your 26 AS with your books of income. You may be doing it in Excel, but there are a lot of human errors. I'm not talking only from responding to tax notices perspective. Imagine someone has withheld taxes not reported in his TDS return. It will never be reflected in your 26 AS. Your books on your 26 AS are showing a difference. You would never know unless this reconciliation is done. So you're actually losing out on cash flows. So, you know, maybe automating 26 AS reconciliation, TDS, TCS, simple processes, you know, which take a lot of time. I think in the last three years, there have been at least seven new TDS and TCS provisions. To manage all those with their each having its own conditions and quantums, and then if you don't have a tax return filed for two years, you need to have a higher rate and all that stuff. It all could be automated. 15 CACB, this is a niche area where you uh, can use a tool. For example, uh, when you are doing a foreign remittance for a 15 CACB, these are notices that are being used, uh, issued. That 15 CA issue, kiya tha, I touched upon it earlier. Tell us what you did. The tools can help you retain the data as well as archive the data, as well as help in responding to notices very easily. These are two tools that are that may help a lot. Email, a notice has been issued on the tax department. We have not received an email. We have no clue that it has been issued. Then there is a second show cause directly coming in that you have not responded to previous notices and therefore we are issuing you a show cause. Bring in a litigation tool for, uh, you know, monitoring that. Department has issued, department has bought in technology in terms of using the income tax portal and sending you automated emails. That technology may not work at times. So then bring in a tool to, you know, get your litigation in place. Saves a lot of time also actually. Compliance tools, there could be various compliance tools where, you know, not only tax related, but all labor or related due dates and all could be mapped and a MIS report generated for the CFO that, okay, these were the compliances due in this month. All these are due, these are overdue, and these are the consequences. And then there is a GST automation that could happen. Two more that I can say, th uh, I have not put in here. One was the G 3CEB related automation, related party transaction reconciliation and automation along with 3, uh, 3CEB generations. And uh, you could have tools for tracking all your tax related documentation in one place. So this is how I feel risk in today's world has increased multifold, multifold but uh, I think the first step 
to resolving these or handling these um, risk and uncertainties is to be compliant, to be proactive, and to collate data so that reconcile data so that you are proactive in your approach to get out of or reduce your, I won't say it will go away, but reduce it significantly. And maybe to do all of this, use technology to the extent possible so that the time effort involved of manual intervention is reduced. Yeah, that's, that's all. Thank you so much.